This is Lecture 2, Causality. I want to start by res reminding you of some notation and terminology. We say that uh, a population is all the individuals that you would like to consider. So, for example, uh, sorry, I lost that there. For example, you might be interested in all the class or classes offered at Fairfield University this semester. The variable is a question you want to ask about each individual. Maybe you're interested in the number of students in class. Uh, the parameter is a summary or description of the variable in the population. So natural, because that's a numerical variable, number of students, a uh, natural parameter would be the average number of students in all classes at Fairfield University this semester. That noun phrase, which contains the parameter, the variable and the population all in one phrase is the best way to express it. And then we talked about a sample, which is the subset of individuals in the population about which you gather data you hope is representative, so maybe you look at the five classes that you're taking this semester as your sample. And finally, a statistic is just like a parameter. It's a summary or description of a variable, but only in the sample, not in the population. So in this case, you would find the average number of students in the five classes you're taking this semester. If you think about it, if someone, prospective student, asked you, well, you know, what's typical class size at Fairfield U, you might very well briefly think about what classes you're in and how many there are and answer them the average, or an approximate version of the average of your five classes, hoping that that sample statistic was a good representative or approximation of the population parameter they were interested in, that is a baby version of the inference we'll be doing later in the semester in a more quantitatively sound way. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today I want to talk about the relationship between variables. Relationships between two variables are intrinsically more interesting than looking at a single variable at, at a time. We will find when we're looking at relationships between variables, the questions just become more interesting. Um, the most basic relationship we will care about, the most important, is a causal relationship. We say one variable affects another if, when all other variables are held fixed, changing the first on average changes the second. That's called a causal relationship, and it would be better to say is causally related to instead of effects, but no one does because it's too long-winded. So here are some examples I'll get to in a moment, but first a bit of terminology. The variable we're expecting is doing the affecting is called the explanatory variable, and the one that's being affected or that we expect to be affected is called the response variable. The reason I emphasize expecting is that usually we won't know that there's a causal relationship between two variables we'll be thinking about the question. We'll say, well, I wonder if A affects B, or let's investigate whether A affects B. As soon as you're thinking that, A is the explanatory variable, B is the response variable. And the language makes sense, right? The explanatory explains what B is doing. B, the response, is responding to what A is doing. Okay, here are two examples. I'd like you to stop for a moment and see if you can identify, pause the, the lecture, and see if you can identify, first of all, what the explanatory and response variables are. And secondly, remember that variables come in flavors. They can be categorical or numerical. Ask if each of those four variables, since we have two examples, is categorical and numerical. And then resume the tape when you're ready. Here we go. The explanatory variable, the thing doing the affecting, in the first case, it's whether the person smokes a variable. You can ask it about each person. It's a yes or no question. So it is categorical and in fact binary. In the second case, the thing potentially doing the affecting is years of education. And that's pretty clearly numerical, a number between 0 and 20 or something. The response variable in the first case is kind of tricky and it may well have thrown you. That's okay. I wanted to catch this is really a linguistic wrinkle um, rather than conceptual and I wanted to show it to you in right away so you'd be on the lookout for it. You might have thought that the response variable was your chance of having a heart attack 
which you might think is numerical. And that isn't correct. And it isn't correct because the language deceives you. And the language deceives you because the language is sort of built in something that's already in the definition of effects, which is the on average part. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, if you think about what your chance of having a heart attack is and how you'd measure it, it becomes kind of fuzzy. Really, the only way to measure it is wait and see if someone has a heart attack. And of course, if you are going to investigate whether a person smokes, if that affects your chance of having a heart attack, you'd look at people who smoke and see how many of them have a heart attack. So literally, the information you're gathering is whether or not they have a heart attack. So that's the variable. The variable is whether or not they have a heart attack. And we should express this as whether a person smokes affects whether they have a heart attack. But that makes it sound like it's a guaranteed effect that everyone who smokes has a heart attack. Whereas if you look in the definition, uh, it only affect, changes the second on average. So sometimes, so if you smoke, you're more likely to have a heart attack, but you're not guaranteed to have a heart attack. The second example is more straightforward. Years of education affects how much money you make which is numerical. But again, it's only on average. You may find individuals where one person has more education but makes less money. But on average, more years of education go along with more money. <clears throat> on the other hand, two variables are said to be related. People also say associated. They also say correlated, which isn't quite right, as we'll learn later but you'll see all three. If certain values of one, the first variable, are more likely to occur with certain values of the other variable. That may sound like the same thing as causation, but it isn't quite. So here's an example. Uh, if you go to beach towns and you look at how much ice cream is sold each day, and you look at how many drowning deaths there are, or hopefully it's whether there's a drowning death, unless it's a really unsafe beach town, you will find that they are related. Specifically, days when a lot of ice cream is eaten, there are more drowning deaths. But you would be wrong to conclude from that that eating ice cream causes you to drown, or even ups your chances for drowning. So eating ice cream does not affect chance of drowning. What's going on? What's going on is a lurking variable. A lurking variable is a variable which affects the explanatory variable and is related to the response variable. The idea of a lurking variable is it can cause two things that aren't causally related to be associated because of their causal relationship with this third thing, or it can cause two things that are causally related to not be associated. It can cover up a causal relationship, or even in some cases reverse a causal relationship. We'll see that later in the semester. So I want you to stop. This is tricky, but, but you may be able to do it and think about uh, what might be a lurking variable in this case. OK, there are two. Maybe there are more, but I can think of two. So one lurking variable is temperature. On hot days, people are more likely to get ice cream. So temperature affects the explanatory variable of whether you have ice cream, or of how many people have ice cream, sorry. But also, on hot days, people are more likely to go swimming, so they're more likely to drown. So temperature affects, in particular, is related to the response variable. A second variable that's kind of similar is number of visitors. Meaning like, on weekends, lots of people come to the beach town, so of course there's going to be more ice cream sales and more drowning deaths. On weekdays, there'll be fewer of both. So number of visitors affects the explanatory variable and also affects the response variable. Usually, the lurking variable affects the response variable, but it doesn't technically have to. And I want to pause here and say something I'm going to expect you to do is identify potential lurking variables. So if I give you an explanatory and a response variable, I'd like you to think about what are some examples of variables which affect the explanatory variable and are related to usually affect the response variable. That proves to be a tricky thing for people, but it is really important precisely because, as I've mentioned before, 
Many, many studies have flaws in them, and one common flaw is the failure to recognize lurking variables. And the only way you will catch that flaw is if you get into the habit of thinking of potential lurking variables. Once you've thought up what are some possible lurking variables, you can decide whether they are likely to have influenced the result of the study. And when you get into the habit of this, you will frequently hear a study and you will think, oh, but that could just be explained by X. And if you go and look at the details of the study, if you're interested, you may find that it, they never looked at X. And really, that lurking variable that you thought of probably explains the whole thing they, they're seeing. Um. <clears throat> Here's a second example. Coffee drinking is related to heart attacks. People who drink coffee are more likely to have a heart attack. You might think they're causally related. It would make sense. Coffee raises your heart rate. Maybe it puts too much of a demand on your heart rate, but in fact, they're not. In fact, there's a lurking variable, and I'll give you a minute to think about what the lurking variable might be, but I have to say in this case, it's quite subtle. Um, the lurking variable is smoking, and as a sort of hint in the future, when you're looking for lurking variables where the explanatory variable is a behavior, Coffee drinking is a behavior. It's something people do. And frequently, will our explanatory variable will be a behavior. In that situation, the, to find a lurking variable, the best thing to ask yourself is, what kind of person would do that? And what else do I know about that person? Right? Because the goal is to find something that affects the explanatory behavior. So when you ask, what affects a person's behavior, one really common thing is, what kind of person does that? So it turns out, not at all obvious, that people who drink coffee, the kind of people who drink coffee, are more likely to smoke. I don't know why. Maybe because both are known to be unhealthy, maybe because both are stimulants, maybe it's cultural. In any case, it is true that people who drink coffee are also more likely to smoke, and it turns out that smoking does increase your chances of having a heart attack. So the association between coffee drinking and heart attack is purely due to a lurking variable. A common type of lurking variable you may have heard of is the placebo effect. It turns out that you're more likely to feel better if you believe you're being treated. So quite literally, you have a, you have a headache, somebody gives you a sugar pill that doesn't do anything, but because you've gotten medication, you, you, your headache gets better. You feel taken care of, whatever it is. Um, it's extremely robust. All kinds of diseases that you could not imagine uh, could respond to a psychological effect do. Uh, the most dramatic that I know of, there was a, a heart condition that there was a surgical treatment for. People began to be suspicious, wasn't really work, working that well. So they tested it. So, I guess I should say right off the bat that um, the placebo effect, like any lurking variables, once you identify it, you need to control for it. The way you control for a lurking variable is make sure that all the different individuals with different values of the explanatory variable have the same value of the lurking variable. So, that sounds very abstract, but in this context, it simply means that when people want to eliminate the placebo effect, what they do is they compare people getting the treatment they're interested in to people getting a placebo treatment, being given a sugar pill or whatever. If the real people getting the real pill recover better than people getting the sugar pill, then it can't be the placebo effect, because the placebo effect is the same in both. It must be the actual effect of the medication. Anyway, in this instance, they wanted to test the effectiveness of a surgery technique so they had to do placebo, but of course, people who get surgery are going to feel much more like they got taken care of than people who took a pill. So they actually did. I have no idea how they got this approved. Placebo surgery. They opened people up, closed them back up, and sent them off to post-op. And they found that, in fact, this treatment was no more effective than the placebo, but both were effective. So literally, having somebody cut open your body and sew it back up again and not do anything, which surely physically can only be a bad thing, 
caused people with heart conditions to get better. Inexplicable to me, but that is the fact. It even turns out, even if your caretaker thinks that the medication will work, you will do better than if they think it won't work. So when they give people medication in placebo, the person handing them the pill doesn't know which they're giving. That's called a double-blind study, when both the patient and the person treating them don't know whether they're getting a real treatment or not. Um, it's a remarkably effective thing, and here's one interesting example of this, not particularly related to anything in the course, but I found it fascinating. As you probably know, antidepressants are widely prescribed for depression and are considered to be highly effective. They always do well in studies, but it turns out they do well at treating depression, but they only do very slightly better than placebos, than sugar pills, except for severe depression. It's clear that antidepressants work in cases of severe depression, but in cases of mild depression, they work only slightly better than placebos. And in fact, this is a subtle point, they um, are more effective for people who have side effects. So of course, these antidepressants sometimes have side effects. The sugar pills don't. It may be that what's happening is people who have side effects know they're getting the real treatment, so they have a better placebo effect. So it may be that if you gave people sugar pills that caused side effects, you would find that they, their depression gets just as much better as antidepressants. For all we know, the huge amount of antidepressants that are prescribed every day could be mostly useless. Okay, uh, what do you do about a lurking variable? Well, as I said, once you know what you've thought of a lurking variable, you can control for it. So, in the when you're looking at coffee drinkers, you can just make sure to look at people who drink coffee who don't smoke and compare them to people who don't drink coffee who don't smoke. Or who smoke the same amount. As long as the value of the lurking variable is the same in the individuals with different values of the explanatory variable, that no longer is going to cause a difference. That's called controlling for the variable. It's usually pretty easy to do once you've thought of a lurking variable, but the problem is you'll never think of all possible lurking variables. A good example of this is for a long time the case that smoking caused cancer was objected to by mostly by cigarette companies and people they funded and typically what they would do is they would think up lurking variables. They would say, wait, wait, maybe, yes, of course there's an association between smoking and lung cancer, but maybe it's because poor people smoke more and poor people are more likely to get lung cancer. Lurking variable, so they'd go back and they control for wealth. And no, wait, maybe veterans smoke more, and veterans get more lung cancer because of something that happened while they were in the service. Okay, so you go back and you control for that. But you can always think up maybe an implausible, but a conceivable lurking variable. And there may be a lurking variable out there you'll never think of. So what do you do to control for variables you can't think of? There's only one answer, and that's an experiment. What's an experiment? An experiment is a study in which you randomly assign the values of the explanatory variable, keeping all else fixed. When those different values are called treatments. Um, an observational study is where you do not. Again, I am going to ask you to be able to distinguish between an experiment and an observational study, and it's based on this definition, and I have to caution you, the book has a definition which is at best confusing and at worst wrong. So ignore the book on this point. Uh, the, the book makes a big deal about how much you influence or change what's going on having to do with the experiment. That has nothing to do with an experiment. You can do an observational study where you're interfering with what's going on in every possible way as long as you don't assign the values of the explanatory variable randomly. And if you do, no matter how little you influence anything else, it's an experiment. That is the end of the story. An experiment establishes a causal association. Why? Because if you randomly assign some individuals to drink coffee and some individuals not to drink coffee, there's nothing that can affect that that's going to be different between the two groups. 
there can't be a lurking variable. It's more common in one group than the other because they're randomly assigned. Um, only an experiment can establish a causal association. Why don't we do them all the time? The answer is because it's really hard to do experiments. It's easy in physics, that's all they do, because there are no ethical or practical considerations when you're slamming protons into each other. But it's generally impossible when you're dealing with humans. You imagine the smoking example. What would an experiment be? An experiment would be you'd take a thousand people you'd randomly assign 500 of them to smoke, and you would force them to smoke a pack a day for two years. And the other 500, you'd randomly assign not to smoke, and you'd watch them day in and day out. If you ever saw them with a cigarette, you'd run and take it out of their hands. And then 20 years later, you'd look and see how many each got lung cancer. And if you did that, it would settle the question. Absolutely guaranteed. But it's obviously unethical. So experiments are difficult or impossible to do, but establish causal association. In real life, we often have to live with observational studies and a lot of thought about what might be lurking variables. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Our first example, if you imagine how we gathered the data to decide there was a relationship between ice cream sales and drowning, that would clearly be an observational study. Maybe we on 50 days, counted how much the total ice cream sales were, and counted how many drowning deaths there were. And we saw an association. We saw that days with more ice cream sales had more drowning deaths. Uh, how might we have done our coffee study that saw an association with heart attacks? Maybe we would look at 100 people who drink coffee and 100 people who don't, and follow them for 20 years to see whether or not see how many of each group got a heart attack. That's completely straightforward. How would we make an experiment to address these? Well, in an experiment, you'd have to control the, ex you'd have to assign values the explanatory variable randomly. So if it's ice cream eating, you might randomly require 100 people to eat ice cream and 100 people not to eat ice cream, and then watch them for the entire day and see how many of each group drown. You might randomly require 100 people to drink coffee and 100 people not to drink coffee, and then follow them for 20 years and see how many of each group got a heart attack. Again, lung, uh, cigarettes could no longer be a lurking variable because you randomly assign them. The 100 coffee drinkers are no more likely to drink to smoke cigarettes than the hundred non-drinkers. Uh, so I promised you last lecture that I would always tell you the things you should be able to do now at the end of the lecture and the things you should be able to do after you've processed it, after we've done some examples together and worked through some stuff. And here I have some of both categories. So first of all, you should now be able to define explanatory variable, response variable, causation, association, lurking variable, experiment and observational study. You should be able, if I give you a situation, to identify what the explanatory and response variables are. And if I describe a study, you should be able to tell me whether it's an experiment or an observational study. Two things I explained how to do, but which I found are hard and require um, a little practice are first of all identifying lurking variables. So that means I'm going to describe a situation of one variable associated or not associated to another, and you're going to think of things which might be lurking variables. What would those be? They must be variables. So you need to know what the population is. You need to say, okay, population in this case is day is at the beach. Population is individuals, is people, whatever. And then you need to think about a variable, something that's different for each individual, the variable has to affect the explanatory variable, and it also has to affect or at least be related to the response variable. Usually the hard part that people struggle with is finding something that affects the explanatory variable. Um, <clears throat> and uh, secondly, you should be able, if I describe an explanatory and response variable, you should be able to imagine 
an experiment to test whether one whether the two are causally related. Here, the important thing, what I think is tricky for people, is that often the experiment is kind of outland outlandish. It's impractical. It's unethical. That's okay. It's valuable to understand what the experiment would be, in part, so that you know, okay, you can't do an experiment here. So if I ask you to describe what would an experiment be, it's okay if it's silly or impractical, as long as it involves randomly assigning the values of the explanatory variable and then measuring the value of the response variable.